banned. Al Jazeera gets shut down in Israel, just as Israeli forces move into Rafah. Is Italy's Prime Minister, Giorgia Maloney, out to turn state-owned television into state-controlled television? And halfway through India's six-week-long election process, we examine the narratives both in the mainstream media and on the social side. This past week offered a brief moment of hope for the approximately 1.5 million Palestinians trapped in Rafah, supposedly the last safe space for civilians in Gaza. Hamas had accepted the terms of a ceasefire agreement. It looked like lives would be saved. But on Tuesday, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said the proposal fell short of Israel's key demands, and now an assault on Rafah is underway. Coinciding with all of this has been the closure of Al Jazeera's news operation in Israel. Our news coverage, TV broadcasts, and website are all blocked there. That measure may shield Israelis, at least temporarily, from the horrors that are being inflicted on Rafah, but it will not stop this network from covering the story. What it does signal to the world, though, and the Netanyahu government's allies abroad, is that Israel's so-called democracy is not what it's cracked up to be. The Israelis are trying to uh, sort of portray this kind of as like an end game, that this is sort of the last bastion city in the Gaza Strip, where they're claiming that the military operation is not complete until the army goes in with troops to what they describe as dismantling Hamas's remaining infrastructure. The reality and practice of this is that Rafah is right now the only hub for Palestinian life and society and refuge for people who've been displaced for the past seven months from the northern strip all the way down to the south. Rafah was supposed to be the red line that Israel would not cross. Its forces have corralled around 1.5 million Palestinians there, more than half the surviving population. After seven months of punishing civilians with bombs and bullets, you can add another betrayal to the mix. Having advised those civilians to take refuge there, the Netanyahu government now calls Rafah the last stronghold of Hamas. And within a day of rejecting a ceasefire that Hamas had agreed to, that would have freed every remaining Israeli hostage, Netanyahu sent in the troops for reasons that may be far more political than strategic. So his desire to continue this genocide is both because he's genocidal, but also because he is a survivalist and he wants to make sure that he remains in office. The bigger issue is that it seems to be that there are no red lines. Back in March, we heard President Biden say, but there's red lines that if he crosses and they can, he cannot have 30,000 more Palestinians dead. And then he very quickly backtracked from that. They've made a mockery out of the international legal system as we know it. They've made a mockery out of, um, out of the genocide convention. And the fact that Netanyahu continues to be able to do whatever he wants to do just shows you uh, how genocidal he is and how genocidal the United States is as well. Of the four interviews in this piece, you will notice that only one of them is via webcam, the one we did in Israel. We had no choice, given that on the eve of going into Rafah, the Netanyahu government banned Al Jazeera from the Israeli airwaves and from reporting from there. In announcing the police raids on Al Jazeera's offices, Israel's communications minister called the network a threat to Israeli security because it broadcasts statements issued by Hamas. What Al Jazeera really is, is a clear and ever-present danger to the Israeli narrative. It has journalists on the ground in Gaza, documenting the story the way most international news outlets cannot, since they have been locked out by Israel. Western news outlets forced to cover Gaza at a distance have reported on the Israeli crackdown on Al Jazeera. But in an industry that usually stands up for its own, there has been a noticeable lack of solidarity there. Al Jazeera, I think many people, uh, if, if they do watch it, would see it as some kind of propaganda. They would see it. The news media outside of uh, Israel is captive in a way to this pro-Israel narrative, and they don't consider Al Jazeera as one of their own. 
So Al Jazeera is othered because it is funded by Qatar. Netanyahu has attacked Qatar, even though it's instrumental in mediating for a ceasefire. So that's why there is hardly a ripple of dissent among foreign media. But those of us who need that diverse view of what's happening in the Middle East know that that is false. The notion that by broadcasting the statements of Hamas or interviewing people that the Israelis are designating as terrorists is supporting terrorism means that you don't actually believe in real journalism. You know, I follow the telegram feeds of the Al Qasim brigades, the, the armed wing of Hamas. And because I follow uh, that feed in addition to Israeli government feeds, I have a much more nuanced picture of what has happened on the ground. The fact is that what they don't like about Al Jazeera's coverage is that it has the audacity to contradict the Israeli narrative or to simply do the job of journalism. While the Israeli military and politicians alike have been making these claims for some time, they have not been providing the evidence needed to support them. It's not that Al Jazeera is advocating Hamas's position. It's that Al Jazeera is allowing people to make up their own mind. Including Benjamin Netanyahu's own Minister of Justice, who, according to reports in two Israeli newspapers, relies on Al Jazeera's coverage of Gaza. The Israeli authorities would do better to focus on their own airwaves. The same government that just shut down a news network for, quote, endangering Israeli soldiers has no issues when a senior official in the ruling Likud party goes into an Israeli news studio, talks about Palestinian civilians in Gaza, and comes out with this. <laughs> When you live here, seeing those types of clips is actually a daily occurrence. This, this is not an aberration. We see almost daily uh, politicians make these, making these genocidal statements on television. We hear them on radio, in print. It happens all the time. We hear not just commentators, but sometimes the journalists themselves making these exact same statements. Israel is a country that is in genocidal fever. And the reason that they don't want networks like Al Jazeera here is because they don't want anybody covering the genocidal fever that has taken shape inside Israel. And if you look at Israeli media from the beginning of the war, it's basically been a cacophony in support of the war. There's this kind of popular consent for creating this kind of singular uh, hegemonic narrative for everyone to believe in, to allow the government and the army to do whatever it needs to. And that coverage is obviously not showing Israelis uh, what is happening to Palestinians on the ground, the number of people who are being killed, any testimonies of how that war is being waged. When that is your media environment, then you're having a, you're having a society that is not able to confront the realities of what their country is waging. A society that likes to describe itself as a democracy, the only one in the Middle East. Israel's the only true democracy uh, in this region. That is a narrative Israel's government constantly puts out there, and it resonates with its media allies abroad, who venerate Israel's democracy regardless of the crimes against humanity that it commits. You're not Hamas. Israel is a democracy and uh, as a Jewish state uh, supports right. and, and believes in every life mattering. And so but since when have apartheid states been considered true democracies just because they hold elections? And what kind of democracy locks the global media out of a war zone that has become a slaughterhouse for civilians, kills journalists there at an unprecedented rate, and then bans one of the only news channels that has its own reporters in Gaza, survivors, risking their lives to get the story out. We need to talk about that uh, term democracy. Um, Israel calls itself a democracy. Its citizens think of itself as a democracy, but it isn't a democracy at all. Uh, you could call it an ethnocracy with superior rights to Israeli Jews. 
You could call it a theocracy because it's captive to the religious elements and religious leaders and also the ministers that bring a, uh, a far-right Jewish interpretation of uh, Jewish law into uh, the Israeli secular context. <laughs> So this is not a democracy that we're talking about. Perhaps nothing unmasks that in a more powerful way than that state, which is supposedly the only democracy in the Middle East, waging a genocidal war of extermination against the Palestinians, while simultaneously trying to shut down the single most important network that is broadcasting the other side of the barrel of the Israeli gun that is being pointed at the people of Palestine and fired nonstop for seven straight months to the tune of almost 35,000 confirmed deaths. It serves as a very powerful symbol of a narrative based entirely on lies, that somehow there's some justifiable aspect to any of this. Journalists at Italy's public broadcaster, Rai, have gone on strike. Salaries and working conditions are part of it. The bigger issue is political interference, and the politician they accuse of that is Prime Minister Giorgia Maloney. Tarek Nafa is here with more. Well, journalists at Rai staged a walkout over what their union called suffocating control by Giorgia Maloney's administration and an attempt to turn the network into, quote, a mouthpiece for the government. The journalists' union says it wants to stop political appointments in key editorial roles, as well as the censoring of voices and stories that do not fit with the ruling coalition's far-right agenda. It's common for governments in Italy to appoint loyalists to top jobs at Rai, but since she took office in 2022, Maloney's perceived interference in the broadcaster has led some high-profile presenters and managers to quit. This latest showdown between Rai's staff and the government goes back to April 25th, Italy's Liberation Day, when a prominent author, Antonio Scurati, was scheduled to deliver an anti-fascist monologue. But just hours before the show was meant to air, Scurati was informed by Rai that his appearance had been cancelled for what the newspaper La Repubblica later revealed were, quote, editorial reasons. Scurati's words were eventually read out by a host at Rai, Serena Bortone, in an act of solidarity. La Presidente del Consiglio, quando costretta ad affrontarlo dagli anniversari storici, si è pervicacemente attenuta alla linea ideologica della sua cultura neofascista di provenienza. Ha preso le distanze dalle efferatezze indifendibili perpetrate dal regime, la persecuzione degli ebrei, senza mai ripudiare nel suo insieme l'esperienza fascista. For Scurati and many others in Italy, the whole affair was a blatant act of censorship, one that fits into a wider pattern from Maloney's government, which is trying to remake the media, as well as cultural institutions, in its own political image. Journalists at The Public Broadcaster, speaking off the record, say that for this government, Rai is a symbol of the so-called dictatorship of the left. They think if they control the media, they will change the cultural narrative in Italy. Thanks, Tarek. India is halfway through an election process, a voting marathon that lasts six weeks. Calling an election historic is a bit of a cliche, but this one really does qualify. Should the ruling BJP and Prime Minister Narendra Modi win, it would be the first Indian government to win elections back to back to back with three terms in office. So the BJP is throwing all it can at this campaign. Modi's face is everywhere. There's been an avalanche of BJP advertising. And then there are India's mainstream media outlets, the overwhelming majority of which are pro-Modi. The potential spanner in the works is the messaging from a collection of YouTubers putting out explainers, critiques and interviews, all questioning the BJP's otherwise dominant narrative. Many are journalists who gave up mainstream newsrooms for places in the online ecosystem. Akash Banerjee is one of them. He has four million followers and his videos are racking up the views.
देशभक्त पर जब भी हम एपिसोड बनाते हैं कोशिश करते हैं कि रिएक्शनरी ना हो मैंने आनंद फानंद में आकर कुछ ना ऐसा बोल दे जो बाद में गलत साबित हो जाए थोड़ा सा ठहराव लेकर रिसर्च करके पॉइंट्स लेकर उसके बाद हम एपिसोड बनाते हैं आकाश बैनर्जी जॉइंस अस नाउ फ्रॉम न्यू दिल्ली मिस्टर बैनर्जी ऑन द सरफेस दिस इलेक्शन लुक्स लाइक अ डन डील गिव अस अ सेंस ऑफ व्हाट नरेंद्र मोदीज अपील टू द इंडियन इलेक्टोरेट इज बिल्ट ऑन Well, um, to begin with, I wouldn't say that it's all done and dusted. Um, Indian elections uh, tend to be remarkably unpredictable. While Modi is definitely uh, far up ahead, things change very rapidly in Indian politics. You see the prime minister a lot less confident. You see him going back to his old tricks. Um, so, therefore, I wouldn't uh, say it's done and dusted. A lot of Modi's charm, charisma, appeal comes from the fact is that people. really find themselves attracted to this man who seems to be in control whether or not he is whether the data suggests that it's a separate issue this is politics so that is the charm which unfortunately for the opposition no one comes even close to so those people who are not very happy with narendra modi at this point of time they are not happy maybe what has happened 10 years after his rule find he's the only guy around to vote for Among the people unhappy with Modi's rule is the country's largest minority, its Muslim population. Over the years, Modi has left some of the ugly talk to his proxies on that. Mm -hmm. But recently in this campaign, he's been a little bit more vocal and some of the things he's come out with, like this next bit, uh sound a little bit dangerous. Pehle humne love jihad suna tha, fir humne land jihad suna tha. a board jihad so how do you explain this change of tack by modi the fact he's a, a little more direct these days that is the question if if there was one question to be asked regardless of who wins who loses this election the one question to ask is what really happened remember as you pointed out narendra modi himself doesn't do the dog whistling he has enough and more people to do the dog whistling some brazen calls to violence some hints of genocide being dropped here and there and suddenly after the first phase of election you see this man come back uh, into his old role congress ke neta kehte hain ki desh ki sampatti par pehla haq minority ka matlab musliman ka hai somewhere down the line the bjp has understood that the campaign of progress that india is on the right track india has developed people have more money is not really going to work and therefore harking back to the fear psychosis of the people majority versus minority 80% versus 20% these 20% are going to expand they are going to take away your space your political space they'll become the prime minister etc etc the sad truth here is that this tactic has never failed narendra modi it has always yielded him good electoral results so the, so what he's doing he's doing fully aware of what he's doing and it may just work also for him we cannot discuss politics in india without talking about the mainstream media you used to work in that sphere you've since gone independent talk to us about how media in india has been transformed in the period of narendra modi's rule when i joined uh, television uh, media in 2004 2005 when the, there was a plethora of new television channels that were coming in television was on a high uh, it was the aspirational job to be in and i thank my stars that i quit in 2012 because what has happened after 2014 is that the gradual takeover of mainstream media has happened uh, by the bjp and there is a terminology also that is used for the mainstream media in india which is called godi media is basically a media that sits in the lap of those in power and what has happened is that that media has really allowed narendra modi to take on a force which is much larger than him um you can imagine him as a senior of a family where his decision should not be criticized so no idea that he can come up with can be a bad idea every idea is a good idea and if it fails it's 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 the implementation so the media really has allowed for the dumbing down uh, of the political discourse uh, and questioning of the opposition rather than the questioning of the government in power 
Well, you fled the mainstream media space. You've succeeded. You now have one of the country's most popular YouTube channels. As a YouTuber, does pressure still land on you in some ways? Walk us through that world. So there are two levels of pressure, uh, I think. The easier level of pressure uh, is the direct level of pressure. Uh, so, for example, trolling in India is an industry where you have people literally sitting on rows and rows of computer and doing work for a political party. Uh, and of course, uh, the BJP really have the largest online social presence and uh, saying anything against the establishment will really result in voluminous uh, and really toxic abuse. Then comes the soft pressure uh, in terms of people reaching out to you, telling you subtly, uh, what are you doing? Why are you just asking questions to the government? Why don't you ask questions to the opposition? Um, and, and subtle hints would be dropped your way is that do watch out. Uh, uh, you may have trouble coming your way. So that's a fear that one lives in. I mean, somebody asks me, uh, what's your business plan? And I jokingly tell them it's to stay out of prison. Uh, that's the plan. Um, the worst of the pressure, indirect pressure that's going to come in very soon are the kind of regulations that are being brought into effect. Already we have the new IT regulations, which basically can allow the government to pull down any YouTube channel, Twitter handle, based on national security interest. On top of that, you have a new broadcast bill, which will basically give the government a lot more powers over even YouTube channels. If the government or any of the citizens are not happy with any report that we do, they can write to us and we are duty bound to answer within 24 hours. So technically, they can bury us in paperwork with 500 complaints on a day. It's using the law against the people who are trying to uh, maintain the Constitution, trying to speak out for laws and values, and using that very same law against them. When we discuss politics in India, we do tend to let audiences off the hook. We don't really hold audiences accountable for the material that they seem so ready and eager to consume. What has the success of Modi and the BJP revealed about how gullible or perhaps ideologically right-wing Indian news audiences really are. Do you buy that? Um, that's one of the saddest parts, actually. Um, I, I, I come from a generation of television that was degenerating. Then I come from this last 10 years of watching television. And I always had seen... Um, uh, the silent uh, spectator, the viewer, who earlier used to say, oh, what is going on on Indian television? Oh, this noise, this hate that is going on in Indian television. Had I had an opportunity of watching something else, I would have. The Prime Minister has complete and remarkable clarity on issues. It's only after doing independent journalism, doing a YouTube channel after so many years, one gets to understand is those were just excuses. Nobody wants to watch sensible news. Nobody wants to watch just the facts. The fact is that while the government is pressurizing mainstream media, owning mainstream media, people also love watching this kind of vile, bigoted content. Otherwise, these channels would have gone out of business. What the mainstream media, what the government has been able to do is to tap in into that deep-rooted bigotry that people have within them, exploit it, enable it, and embolden people to go ahead and then speak out what was inside them, their hearts. So the fear psychosis is being played full on. And this election will show us just how much fear uh, you can inject into people. Akash Banerjee, thank you so much for taking the time and walking us through the politics and the coverage of the Indian election. Thank you for speaking to us today here at The Listening Post. Thanks for having me over. And finally, last week, we reported on the campus protest movement in the U.S., including at Columbia University in New York, where students and faculty were demonstrating against Israel's war on Gaza. That same school hands out Pulitzer Prizes, one of the most prestigious awards in American journalism. And when it announced its list of winners this past week, one organization stuck out. The award for international reporting went to the New York Times for its, quote, wide-ranging and revelatory coverage of Hamas's attacks on October 7th and Israel's devastating response. The paper won despite multiple issues that audiences have raised over the Times' coverage of Gaza, questions over terminology, emphasis, and an institutional pro-Israel bias, typified by a now-notorious investigation that accused Hamas of using systemic rape 
on October 7th, co-written by a former Israeli intelligence officer. With zero journalistic experience, that article was thoroughly debunked and got all kinds of pushback in the Times' own newsroom. But that's award-winning journalism in America these days. We'll see you next time here at The Listening Post.